I, I sent David a cold email four or five years ago. And for those of you who don't know, David Sable was the global CEO of the world's largest advertising agency, Young and Rubicam. He presided over 188 offices in 170 countries. He's one of the biggest names in advertising alive today. Um, I had absolutely no expectations of receiving a response. I was given his email address. I've, I, had, I have sent a lot of cold emails in my time, just reaching out, trying to say hello, trying to network. Um, 30 seconds later, I got a response. I said, look, I'm running a very small shop in Long Island. You're a global CEO of the largest advertising agency in the world. You speak at conferences. I've been following your YouTube videos. Um, just if you're speaking at another conference, let me know. I'd love to come down and shake your hand. Just say hello. I don't know, 60 seconds later, without exaggeration, I get an email, I get an email back. Four words, five words. I'll spring for a sandwich. Um, so the next I heard was from his secretary. We set up dinner. Uh, this was four and a half years ago, and I really mean this sincerely. It's not an exaggeration. We wouldn't be here today. This event would not be taking place if it wasn't for David's mentorship, his love, his care for not only myself, but for the rest of our team, his involvement, the countless hours that David has given um, really with no, no expectation or even like anything I could have possibly given in return, just really out of the kindness of his heart. Uh, David's heart is, is larger than the ocean. His knowledge of advertising and of creative um, and just how marketing and messaging works is second to none. Um, it's an unbelievable honor and a treat that he is here with his guests. And um, without any further delay and with great thanks and with great humility, I'd love to welcome David and the panel to the stage. Okay, I, like my mother wrote that, so. And she's not alive anymore, so I don't know. Okay, thank you so much, Isaac. Um, forget what he said. I'm gonna introduce the panel in a second, but I need your energy. So everybody stand up. Stand up, let's go. Stand up. Stand up. Put your phones down, because see, this is not a digital session. So I don't want anybody looking at their phone. I don't want you texting. I don't want you, afterwards you can text and put our pictures up, like do whatever you want. But right now, you're gonna stay focused with me the whole way. You with me? Everybody with me? All right, so at the count of three, just loud as you can, like literally, I want to see the light bulb shake. Just scream, primal scream. Doesn't have to be right, you scream whatever you want. You get all shit, I don't care, honestly. But just loud, loud primal scream, as loud as you all can. No wussing out here, it's gotta be really loud because we need your energy, right? So at the count of three, I just want to hear it, shake the walls, let's go. One, two, three! Awesome, sit down. All right, so this session, you just heard a little bit about insight. You heard my good friend Marvin talk this morning about briefs. We're gonna take it to the next level. So without any further ado, let me introduce my two good friends and colleagues, Jason and Ryan. All right, he's coming in a minute. And I'm gonna let them introduce themselves and tell you what they do, and then we're gonna dive in. You ready? I can shop the... All right, we'll pass it, there you go. Do we have one for him? Or we just expect them to like lip sync? You good? <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna let Jason tell you a few words about himself, but I just wanna say I've known Jason now for 12 years or so. I first met him in South Africa. Um, we bought his business and brought it in, and now he's running a big piece of it, and he's running one of the biggest accounts in WPP, one of the most important accounts in WPP. And meeting him in South Africa was just one of the great moments of my life, I have to say, and we've been buddies ever since. So, Jason, say a few words about yourself and what you're doing today. Thanks, David, very kind words. Hi, everybody. Uh, so I'm Jason Zanopoulos. I'm the, currently the Chief Creative Officer for VML YNR North America and the Global Chief Creative Officer for uh, for Ford across WPP, um, as, as David says, a very, very large account. So um, with that comes a lot of complexity as well. You can probably hear from my accent that I'm not from New York. I've been living here 
for about five years now, but I'm from, from South Africa. Okay. And he still hasn't learned English, so what can you do? <laughs> this is English. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I started out life as a, as a film director and a screenwriter and then uh, got sucked into advertising at some point in time. Um, and it's been, a, it's been a wild and wonderful ride and, and uh, David's been an important part of it. So happy to be here and to chat to you all. Not only did he get sucked into advertising, but he built what was the primo digital agency in South Africa, which is why we bought them. And really just absolutely primo, one of the best agencies that, that we ever acquired. So that was good. And thanks for doing And that. sitting to my left is somebody who comes out of that system, also from South Africa, who is currently the creative director of the very same account that he runs, the Ford account, which we're going to talk about. It is one of, as I said, it's one of the most important accounts in WPP. It is an incredibly important account in the world. Um, those of you who know the car business know that Ford is a major player, if not the major player. So say a few words about yourself. Yeah, hi everyone. You'll, you'll notice my accent similar to the guy over there. <clears throat> um, so yeah, we couldn't actually, afford people who spoke English. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I um, I actually met Jason. Uh, I joined this digital agency called Native in South Africa just as it was getting out of the gates. I, I come from a background of working in advertising, design, uh, filmmaking as well. Worked as a director and did some documentary stuff and all sorts of kind of fun things. And then I met Jason who thought I was coming for a job interview when I was actually just coming to help them out and he kept asking me why I wanted to work there and I kept saying I don't. <laughs> um, but we've ended up working together and growing that agency in South Africa. I only arrived in New York three months ago so I'm really fresh off the boat and um, you know, now here to, to uh, lead uh, Ford as Chief Creative Officer for North America and team up with Jason again and, and do some kick-ass work. So excited to be a in your awesome city, so, yeah. All right, so, I believe that our session is really critical to what you guys do. All right, so, you've heard all the digital information, it's really important, because it's what drives the system, but now you're gonna learn what goes into this system, like, what do you put at the front end? One of the biggest problems that digital agencies typically have is that they get all of the digital stuff right, but somehow they miss the point that unless you have great creative, great content, really motivating stuff in there, that all your analytics, all your digitalization, all your use of Google, of Facebook, of whatever, is all worthless if you don't have great insight on the creative. Not just on the digital, not just on the, but on the creative. Everybody with me on that? So we're gonna talk about a brief. How many, do we have any lawyers here? No, good. So how many of you have ever used a brief? Put your hands up, because I can't see you. Don't, don't wuss out. So very few of you have. So what's a brief, tell them. Well, I mean, uh, you know, in simple terms, what, what differentiates what we do in this industry from fine art, for example, is that we apply creativity in service of solving a problem. Um, and the brief is really there to explain what that problem is and to hopefully, if it's a, if it's a good creative brief, um, give you the angle of attack and the insights you need to overcome that challenge. To and solve in that your problem. career, how many different types of briefs have you seen? Well, I mean, too, too many to count. Too many to count. So here's the bottom line. Don't waste your time worrying about the brief, like which brief you use, just find one and use it. Simple. So what goes into a simple brief, Brian? Um, it's basically an insight. I mean, if you, if you have a, a, something that sparks imagination, a simple question, something that, that really provokes an answer or inspires an answer, I think that's, that's a perfect brief. Uh, for me, you know, we've seen a million different versions of this, but um, it can be one line that doesn't need to be. But how do you get to that one line? So what would you, like, what are the three, four, two questions that you should ask in the brief? Obviously who you're talking to, but what else? Good, I can see you're ready to answer. No, I mean, I think, I think, the, I think that the, 
the first thing you have to do is, is really understand the problem. You have to understand what question is being asked of you because I think a lot of times the brief goes wrong at the very first line, which is the objective. Because if a client comes to you and says, well, we're losing market share, that, that sounds like it's the problem, but actually there's a problem behind that problem. And you have to identify what that problem is and then set the objective of solving that problem. If you misinterpret what that objective is, you misinterpret what that problem is, then everything that flows from it ends up being wrong. So the first thing you do is identify the problem. What is it you're trying to solve? Exactly. Right? So here's the bottom line, right? Next time you watch anything, whether it's you're streaming, you're watching broadcast, you're on digital, it makes no difference. Look at whatever advertisement you see, or outdoor, I don't really care, and ask yourself if you think the creatives understood the problem. Have they, what you see in front of you, has that answered the question? My bet is that in 60% of the time you're just gonna be scratching your head and you'll have absolutely no idea what they were trying to, what they were trying to solve. So the first thing is identify the problem. What's the second thing? So I think once you've identified the problem uh, or the objective, the next thing that you have to really understand is what is the biggest obstacle standing in your way of solving that problem? So here is the problem, let me go and solve it. What is the thing that is standing in my way? Because that's the thing you need to attack. So what's the barrier, the barrier to success? Everybody get that? Everybody understand why you need that, why that helps you get to the, yes? Any questions? We're gonna be interactive here. Anybody have a question about that? You all get that, right? So you get the objective, what are you trying to solve, and then what's standing in the way of your being able to solve because that is your creative insight. That's the thing that's gonna drive you to an answer, right? Good. Well, yeah, I think so. The, the next thing really is, is that human insight. And, and the word insight is, 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 so, is, is so, you know, kind of um, uh, weighted down at this point in time because there's so many different definitions of what an insight is and it's, it's, such, a, it's such an ephemeral thing anyway. But so, let, so let's talk about it as a human truth. It's, it's some thing about your audience and, and, and ideally about human beings in general that is going to give you the fuel you need to springboard over that obstacle. So I've got, an, I've got an objective that I need to solve. I've got a barrier that is standing between me and that objective. Now what I want to find is some nugget of truth about human beings, some trigger point that I can push that will help me to springboard over that So obstacle. give us an example. Of an insight? Yeah. <laughs> he looked at you. I just looked at you. Not Ford, hold Ford. No, no, hold forward. Give because me, we're give come me back the easy question, right? Um, no, I mean, I think, I think to the challenge point, like there'll be a million challenges standing in the way of achieving an objective sometimes, and you have to make sure you're choosing the one that can be solved by what you're able to do, right? It, it has to be relevant to the sphere of things that you're working on. It can't be like a pure distribution challenge that we can never solve or something like that. So it's, you know, finding that challenge and then really searching for that human truth um, it helps unlock or overcome it. The one that I always loved, um, I think it was PNG. I actually can't remember where it came from, but it was kind of a statement that every time a child is born, a mother is born as well. And I just loved that as an insight where, you know, if we want to reach mothers, you know, a mother's being born as well at the same time as a child. And I just thought it was a beautiful Brilliant. question or sort of insight that goes, okay, we need to speak to someone who is going through a birth of some kind as well with the products we're trying to, trying to sell them. That's awesome, that's a great one. Let me give you one that's a bad one, but one that you'll learn from. So some of you might remember, um, back in probably 96, so those of you who were, anybody here born in 96? I'm getting, I feel like a little old in this group. So it was the beginning of the digital quote unquote revolution, and there was a famous pet company that was selling direct, it was mostly online, it was one of the first, and all of their advertising was around a little puppet. And the little puppet was a little doggy puppet. And the thing about the way they showed the puppet, and some of this is very American, and some of you might remember it, they showed the hand. 
because they thought that that was part of the coolness of it. They just saw the hand going. Well, the business tanked. Why did it tank? What did they miss? Anybody know? Take a guess, somebody. What did they miss? What insight did they miss? I can't, I apologize, I can't. Okay, the focus might have been taken away from the actual product. Good, what else? Anybody? All right, really simple. Yeah. Okay, the focus was taken away from the dog owner. Also interesting and good, but I'll tell you what the real insight was that they missed. You see, people love their dogs. They love their animals. Like, who that owns a dog wants to see a stupid puppet with a hand that's making fun of their dog ownership and of their dog? Nobody. And so the piece that they missed, and go today, watch anything, whether it's Chewy's or any of the, the people who've actually been successful at this, it's all about the emotional connection between the owner and the dog and, as we say, the product. So you're all right, but that one piece that's important is that emotional connection, the human truth. Everybody see that? The human truth was the simplicity of it all, is that people love their dogs, they don't hate their dogs. Okay, great. So now, anybody have any questions just about the basics of the brief? Because now we're going to get into what that is. So what do you put into it? Like, to prepare for a brief, what should you do? What should you learn about the product, about the service, about the... Well, I mean, as much as possible, I think one of the downsides of our quick access to information that we now have on Google and, and, and you know, in, in many other sources is that strategists and creatives have stopped going out into the world and interacting with people uh, and the people that they're trying to talk to. So I think, I think you, you need to learn as much as you can about that industry. You need to learn as much as you can about that particular brand, that particular product, and all of the people that, you're, you know, that, are, that may be interested in it. So I think that, that all provides you with, um, with, with a fundamental foundation from which to identify relevant insights, et cetera. Anything to add? Yeah, I think it's, you know, we, we say it with surfing all the time, it's a lifestyle. It's like literally, it's, it sounds super cheesy, but if you're not a curious human that's curious about why people behave in a certain way, you're not going to just accidentally discover amazing insights. And I think, you know, there's a place for desktop research, there's a place for reams of data, but it was good to hear the other guys talking about why behind the data, because... Without the why, it's kind of meaningless. You know, there's data everywhere. There's data points in every conversation, um, but you have to be kind of curious and listening for it, and you know it when you find it. And by the way, the digital data that you heard about and the why and the insights are critical to understanding this because it does tell you something about behavior, but it doesn't. It only tells you about the behavior that happened a second ago, and it's typically transactional. That's why you have that data. But you have to go beyond that transactional. You need the transactional. You need to understand it because often that can be part of the barrier. But you have to get beyond it. You have to understand, again, coming back to that notion of the human truth. Now, how many of you would say that you or the people around you, when you have a product that you look at or a service that you talk about, have always tried it, used it, really understand it or you've just kind of, and be honest, or they've just kind of read the spreadsheet about it and you know, do their best. So who thinks that they've actually really immersed themselves in everything about their client product? Can't only be beer brands as well. It's <laughs> yeah, not many hands up. And so that, guys, is really critical. I once had a, a creative director who worked for me who, when I tried to take him, to the labs of Colgate. Colgate is, was, is still is a big global client of, of VML Y&Rs. Said to me, no, 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 don't clutter my mind. I don't need to know that. And I'm like, wow. Like, what are you gonna make creative about if you don't understand the product? So he didn't want his mind to be cluttered. Your mind needs to be cluttered in the biggest way. You need to understand the product. You need to try it. You need to talk to people who love the product you need to talk to people who have used the product and stopped using it. 
barrier, like you want to understand why they came into the franchise and why they left. And the third, and maybe the most important, are people who hate it and are never going to do it or use it because you want to understand why. Everybody got that? So three types of people you have to talk to. It makes no difference what the product or service is. In order for you to develop the kinds of insights that you're hearing about, you need to talk to those people, yes? Good. So before we get into some specifics, I want to get into a couple of specific Ford briefs. But the difference between an execution, and this is critical for all of you, an execution and an insightfully driven creative unit is really simple. And then we'll, I'll give you my view and then we'll hear from, from our panel. If you come to tell me the idea and you start by saying, oh, it's awesome, man, wait till you see this. We're gonna open up on fireworks and the fireworks are gonna light the sky. And then there's gonna be this sound and you're gonna see Brad Pitt come running out of the smoke and behind him, you're gonna see the entire Yankee team coming and marching in order to, that's an execution, right? That's got zero to do with insight. But if you can come and give me the elevator pitch about an idea and put the idea in my head without me seeing anything, I don't need to see a piece of paper, I don't need to read the copy, you just tell me this is the idea. So I'll give you one example. This came from Australia years ago for Kentucky Fried Chicken. And I just love this idea. The brief, the, the insight, the thing was, families traveling on the road, Australia's a big country, right? They're driving hours, hours, hours. They were so hungry, they could eat their car. And the whole spot was the family is like on the road someplace. And literally, as they're driving, they're eating the car. And as they pull up to the Kentucky Fried Chicken, they're sitting in a chassis with a motor, and they see the Kentucky Fried Chicken, they're the most excited people in the world, and they go in and buy it out. It was one of the most, in that particular year, it was one of the most productive units that Kentucky Fried Chicken ran, because it got it across. But you understand how you could go from explaining the idea to actually creating it, creating the idea. I'm so hungry, you get, like if you're on the road five, you're so hungry, you could eat the car. Simple, right? So give us one. So I mean, I think it's uh, it, you know it's a it's it's a complex complex question, but I think the way I like to think about ideas to avoid people getting into executional um, responses to things is that is that when when we're trying to solve an idea, I, I, I like to use the term a storyable idea. I like the teams to try and find a storyable idea, and a storyable idea is something that you can literally tell endless stories about. So it's an idea that is conceptually clear enough and has sufficient conceptual integrity that you could make your firework TV commercial out of it, you could make social posts, you could create experiences, and it all still ladders up to that one idea. And generally, those storyable ideas sit in the realm of meaning. I mean, for me, at the end of the day, you know, a brand, every brand is a philosophy. It's an ideology. And you need to understand and get to the core of what that philosophy is and then figure out how you're going to bring that to life. So, so I think, for me, ideas that go beyond executions are ideas that are storyable across multiple channels. That's multiple. great. Storyable across multiple channels. Everybody got that? Really, really important. Write that down because it's not just about a unit, it's about multiple channels, cross-platform, but having an idea that's big enough to be storyable across all of them. And the executions might change, obviously change, because each one is a different medium. Yeah. But they're storyable. What do you say? Yeah, I mean, kind of a build on that. And, and you know, I think when, when we go into the studio and we're trying to come up with ideas and strategies and talk about ideas for brands, there's two things for me that are really important. One is the values of the brand, like what are we really trying to say about the brand? And, and we know that people buy far more into values than products now. You know, the, the differentiation is so small between uh, products that the values make a, a real difference. Um, and then, you know, kind of what Jason's saying, but we, we just don't tell me the ad. Like, I, I, I want to know the idea that's going to sit in culture, that's going to become sticky in culture that's going to become part of the world we live in 
if you start with an ad, an ad's one element of that story. It's one little tiny touch point. So it is kind of the storyable idea, but, but to not think of it as an ad at all, to start thinking of it as something we're putting out into culture. And, you know, that's allowed us to make things like creating a new soccer team, soccer, football, soccer here. Create a new soccer team, create a new, um, you know, a new store, open a, um, a store that sells things in a different way. So they all become ads around that. There's an ecosystem of ads that gets deployed from that centralized storyable idea, but you can't start with the ad because it's not enough of, it doesn't contain enough. Of it. So let's take it down to hard reality and let's use Ford as an example. So the car category is always a tough category. Cars are pieces of metal with big engines and there's a lot of things to talk about. There's performance and there's echo performance and there's luxury and there's hard working and there's price and there's all kinds of things. There's also Tesla. And so it's a, it's a competitive and really hard category. So give us a couple of examples from Ford between the two of you to show like how do you take that, how do you take the category, how do you take the barrier, how do you take the insight and turn it into something storyable? Yeah, I mean, I, like I said, I've been here three months, right? So, um, no, we, we, you know, we're working on a lot of stuff at the moment. I think, you know, we're really trying to make it start with insight. I think there's, you know, we, we're speaking a lot with strategy, like it's what I, I told you before, that strategy's got a habit of, of going around and kind of telling you about, if you imagine strategy as an archaeological dig, that they sort of tell you they dug over here for a bit and then they used a little pick to dig here and then they used the brushes to do something here and then dug a little bit more there, but they never tell you about the treasure. And so the treasure is the insight that we're looking for, particularly on a brand like Ford where, you know, there's a lot to do, there's electrification, there's multiple categories within that. Um, I think we're just sort of doing all the groundwork now to really start setting up for a big change within the brand. But you can see immediately from that type of you know, simplification of the problem, the ideas are starting to flow. I don't think we are putting it out yet. We, it's work in progress. Yeah, I think, I think all of that's true. And I think, I think the other thing to say is that, first of all, the automotive category is changing rapidly. You know, any category that has a big disruptor in it is going to change, like like Tesla. Uh, obviously, there are major sustainability issues um, that the, the automotive industry is dealing with, and so the move to electrification is, is changing the buying process, the owning process, the competitive set, uh, and, and, and many other things. And so automotive manufacturers have to change with that. And I think one of the things that, that automotive manufacturers have to realize is that they are not selling a product in the form of sheet metal. They're not selling a three-dimensional physical object. They are selling a lifestyle. They're selling um, an experience that people are going to live with for many, many years. So one of the things that we're really focused on is that you know, when, we, when we looked at it and, and when Ford looked at it, what we realized is that the average car buyer spends about four hours researching a vehicle before purchase. They spend about 900 hours with that vehicle after they've purchased it. And most of the attention was being spent on figuring out how to talk to car buyers during those four hours rather than how to talk to them during those 900 hours. And so we're really shifting our focus away from, not away from, but rather than exclusively focusing on how you speak to people during those four hours before they make a purchase, figuring out how you speak to them and enrich their experience with the vehicle over the next 900 hours so that you can incre increase the lifetime value of the customer, create advocates, and change the way car ownership works completely. No, go ahead. No, it's, it's that, He's been that, interrupting me for 10 years, it's we, fine. Yeah, <laughs> dog and pony show. Uh, the, you know, we spoke about it before as well, that Nike uh, articulated it really well when uh, Stefan Orlander was, was in charge of Nike and they started that fuel band. Um, you know, I don't know who remembers that, yeah, with the fuel band and data and, like, measurability and everything and that, that buying a, 
a Nike shoe should be the start of the relationship, not the end of it. And I think you see that evidence now with brands like Apple, brands like Nike, how it's an ecosystem around your entire life through apps, advertising, products, all various touch points. And it has to move that way with automotive. So, but let's come back. Yeah, I totally agree. And let's come back to this notion of the four hours versus the 900 hours, because it's really important. So if you were just looking at the purchase cycle, right, and we have all this data because in the WPP ecosystem, we ran for many years the entire purchase process of Ford as well, online and off. So we know that you start looking for cars 12 months before you do your first search. Four months before you get serious, so it's fairly easy, right? We know how to get to you. We know who you are, we know what you're looking for because we see we buy all the right keywords. So 12 months before we start serving you, four months before, but all we're doing is driving you to the same four hours worth of information and not the 900 hours worth of information. Do you see the difference? Everybody get that, why that's completely different? And the truth of the matter is, if you think back to the early days of cars, that's exactly what car dealers did, or the car manufacturers. So there's a reason that Lincoln Mercury and Cadillac became known as luxury cars here, because they sold lifestyle. It was the same body by Fisher, it was the same company made the body of the car, but it was the, it was the emotion that was put around the car. And over time, we lost that because it all sort of merged into one big story, to your point about the sheet metal, as opposed to the lifestyle. And once we lost that, I think it was hard to go back. And so now you got to go the other way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, all vehicles, and this is true of a lot of products as well, as the world becomes increasingly connected, um, the nature of the product changes. So a vehicle has always been a depreciating asset. Um, but in fact, vehicles now with the amount of, particularly electric vehicles, with the amount of software that exists in that vehicle, the amount of customization that comes with that vehicle, so, so cars are becoming more like devices, more like an iPhone. I mean, your iPhone increases in value to you every day you use it because it starts to, it has more of your contacts on it, it starts to understand all of your habits and so it becomes more and more valuable in your hand. The same thing is happening with vehicles because there are over the air updates that are becoming available, there are accessories, there are additional in vehicle software modifications that turn that vehicle increasingly into a device. We've just done some work in China and you look at the electric vehicle market in China, it's kind of insane. It reminds me of um, the dot-com era in the late 90s. There are hundreds of EV brands in China. I don't think there will be hundreds of EV brands eventually, just like there aren't hundreds of Amazons or Facebooks, but, but there is this explosion. You know, they, they are, Alibaba's launching a car. I mean, it's, like, it's just an extension of everybody's business. By the way, just a totally useless fact, but your average car, like your simplest car that you can buy today, new, has probably 40 times the amount of code written into the car than the entire Facebook platform. Like, think about that. Like, we think about, we talk about, we talk about the big tech companies, right? Facebook's big tech, and we think about the car companies somehow as being low tech, and yet the simplest car today has way more lines of code written into it than and, and I think the lesson here is to take it outside of the automotive industry because maybe none of you work in the automotive industry or are going to, but those principles apply to more and more of the, of, of the physical products that exist in the world. More and more physical products now have some kind of digital exoskeleton, some kind of data-driven component to it that turns it, in a sense, into a service. And that's constantly what we're trying to do is turn products into services in one or another form, even if it's just by wrapping services around those physical products. So before we wrap up, any questions? Now's your time. Yes? What, stand up, speak into the mic, tell us your name, yell, for, no, you don't have to yell. Just, Alan. Yeah, 
How do you deal with conflict at that at the decision point? Because when you say, let's say you want to improve an, something about a project about a product, but there's four managers in front of you, all of them saying the other one's market is the pro the other one's piece of it is the problem. And you find the issue with an item, and you're trying to fix it through some sort of campaign or function. But how do you get through that process? Because each department's going to say, you know, our our part is the right part, fix the other part. So how do you deal with those competing interests when you're coming up with the solution to an idea or trying to find what the problems are that you're trying to solve. So uh, is, is, the question, is the question that if, if there is a problem, how do you diagnose the problem when it could sit in one of many different stakeholders' courts and no one wants to admit or accept that it's, that it's there, the problem sits with them? Is that the question? Good. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think it's, uh, it's, the, it's the politics of being human in a sense. I mean, our job every day is to be compelling about putting our point of view forward. So every time we go in with a solution for a client, they have some reason to think that what we're telling them is not right. And so we have to prove that to be right. So that's true whether you're talking to one stakeholder or you're talking to 10 stakeholders. As agencies, the one thing, and, and let's not even use the, the term agencies as kind of you know, marketing consultants, whatever we want to call ourselves, you have to have a point of view. And that point of view has to be backed by, you know, by data and research, but it also should be backed by some kind of intuitive, insightful uh, point of view that you believe in, that you stand behind. And at the end of that conversation, the problem you've identified needs to be clear to everyone you're talking to, because otherwise they're going to tell you to go home. By the way, Jeff Bezos always says that 30% of the answer is always in the intuition which I think is really interesting coming from Jeff Bezos. The other thing that I would say to you is that when you think about all the stakeholders, the truth of the matter is even 100 years ago, there was certain self-defining media that talked to different stakeholders, right? So you knew that if you were in a particular channel, you would talk to a particular set of people who might be stakeholders and your messages might be or should be or could be different. Today, because of our digital opportunities, we can get even more tightly targeted. So the answer is once it's storyable, your story to me might be slightly different than your story to Jason or to Ryan. And if that's the case, then you need to think about that. And like, what is the, is it worth it to be that different? Is it worth it to make it a different story, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So did, can't answer, question get answered? Good. Who else? Yes. Uh, hello, David. I'm, I'm Dr. Rudansky. I'm the father of the genius behind Adventure Media. <laughs> I, and I, 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 love, I love what you're saying. I just wanted to see if I'm hearing it correctly and maybe throw this out and, and get a little clarity. Um, I've been thinking about you know, Major League Baseball has a, a problem marketing. They're losing lots of fans. And I admit that this may be sour grapes since my beloved Yankees were sent home early. Uh, but they, they have a problem. And the question, you know, in terms of, I think, what you're, you're presenting is why? Why do they have a problem? So the question, why do fans come to the ballpark? They come either because they love the game of baseball, which is the aesthetic of baseball, or they're coming to root for their team to win, which is a metric. Uh, and over the past... Uh, many, many years, the metrics are winning out. And I think like what you're ra raising here is a little bit the, the, the conflict that exists between the creative urge, the aesthetic of that which you're marketing, and the metric that goes behind the engine of what's working out. So if you see the marketing now in MBL is uh, the home run and the strikeout, which is a metric. That, that you can figure that out. You know, pitchers can really look at the metrics and figure out how to hit a home run, or how to strike out. To turn a double play, that's the aesthetic of the game. And that play is why most people come to see a baseball game. And I, I think the MBL is misreading and they're losing fans on the fact that uh, this idea, what you're saying today, the love, the sort of intrinsic kind of feeling of the value of something, which draws a person to it, is the aesthetic. And there's a conflict between working out the metric and the aesthetic of that which you're trying to market. And I hear what you say, I, 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 maybe you'll say I have, I'm hearing it correctly, but I'm hearing that you're saying that the aesthetic, the passion, the love behind the value of something 
has a greater ultimate marketable component than purely focusing in on the metric. What would you say to the MBL in terms of, like, how would you work out in terms of what you're saying vis-a-vis -vis Ford to help bring fans back into the ballpark? Uh, to, to make people fall in love with the brand and, and bring them back into the circle of it again, I think <clears throat> it comes back to something Jason mentioned earlier, which is meaning. You know, if, if the brand doesn't stand for something in people's lives, then it is meaningless. It's devoid of meaning. There's no reason to engage with it whatsoever for anyone, you know, for, for me, for somebody else. If, there's, if it doesn't have anything that, any virtue, any values that it puts out into the world, and you can, you can put things out into the world on what you want to say, but there's also things that happen in our world that you have to have an opinion on. And brands are increasingly pulled into that sphere as well, where if you say nothing, you're kind of complicit. So I think you know, driving brand love is a, is a hugely important part of a, a brand like Ford because it is you know, 119 years old. It's been around for a long time. It needs to be refreshed and rejuvenated and move along with the times. But it starts with understanding the overlap between what the brand stands for, what its values are, and what the people you want to reach, what their values are and what they stand for. And meeting at that intersection and creating something, you know, possibly together as well. Um, so, you know, we can create lots of stuff and lots of content and be smart on how we get it to people. We can serve them ads all day, but if there's no meaning behind it, I don't think it ever becomes sticky, and it shouldn't, to be honest. Like you're wasting everyone's time then as well. And I, I really love your point and the way you mapped it out, and because I think that, and it's quite relevant for this conversation because I mean we, we've been talking about insights and a lot of the conversation has been about data and I do think it's a little bit of a false dilemma that has emerged in the industry between the the kind of you know data on the one hand and creativity on the other. These things too should should be two 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 sides of the same coin. But they often aren't, as in your example, where um, you've extracted some element of, of what you thought the magic was and you've turned it into a repeatable metric that, that has become a kind of a, 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 a wireframe of what the thing was that people loved and you've called the thing that people loved aesthetic. Um, I, I think it is, to Ryan's point, that that thing that we call aesthetic, which is is not as quantifiable as the metric that's really easy to you know to to repeat consistently and that that magic that is about meaning and it is about emotion and it is about insight and it is about creativity um, and I do get you know I do get a little dismayed sometimes when I look at the way data is used and automation is used and programmatic marketing is used in our industry because it is often used in place of that magic without which you will never create that meaning. Um, in truth, it should feed into it and it should make the magic even better. Like they should have been able to take whatever those metrics were and use it to make the aesthetic even more beautiful, etc. But more often than not, that's, that's not what I see. I see companies that are using more and more data, using it in place of that, that intuitive creative thinking rather than in conjunction with. And that's the point we have to get to. True data-driven creativity. I don't see a lot of that. I see a lot of data-driven marketing and I see a lot of creativity. I do not see a lot of data-driven creativity, including in all of the companies that tell us that they do that. Right. By the way, I'll just add to that and you can all look this up because it's true. So Amazon, when they announced Amazon Prime back in the day, it's now a few years, said, we are going to have the best content in the world. Why? Because we know everything. We know everything you like. We know everything you buy. We know your tastes. We know what you hate. We know what you love. So our content, ergo, is going to be great. So nobody remembers anything that Amazon produced the first year of Amazon Prime. It was all a wash. Nobody remembers anything. The second year, they fired the guy who was in charge. They brought in another guy who had a press conference, and again, you can find this all online, and he said, and if you remember, they hired the best writers, the best producers, the best directors, the best script runners, they hired the best of everybody. 
And he got up and he said, this is what we're going to do. And somebody in the audience, one of the reporters said to him, well, what about what they said last year? What about all that data? And he said, well, he said, what do you think? You create great content by just putting it all into a computer and this is the quote, doot, 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 out comes a great show. He said, no, it's magic, it's art, it's beauty. And since then, their content has been off the charts. And so that gets to the point, you can't create, you can use the data to know a little bit, but you can't create from the data. And I think in your case, when I think about MLB, see, I think there's a price of entry today for broadcast or for any streaming sports. You need data and you need to have the, you know, you need the, the lines that show you where the, you know, the, the first down is and you need the thing that shows you what the radar speed of the ball, you need all of that, it's price of entry. But I think you have to go back in time to a different time and say, okay, what was it about baseball that caught everybody's attention. Why did we love it? Why was it America's pastime? What's happened since then? Why does it seem boring today? And I think that that is where the answer is and why don't the players seem as, as interesting as some of the other players? So I think there's a lot to be said to your question. I think that's a, it's a good one, but I think the answer is to be found in a lot of what Jason and Ryan says. hopefully answered your question. I think we've come to the end. So again, just quick summary. Um, the brief, you need an insight. Always keep in mind what it is you're trying to accomplish that's critical. What's the barrier? Find the human truth and create storyable moments because that is what's going to make a difference in the work that you present. And with that, we thank Isaac and the team at Adventure Media for having invited us. And I hope you've all had a great day. And one, everybody stand up, one more yell, and we're done. One, two, three, let's go. Everybody up, 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 up. And as loud as you can, shake the roof. One, two, three. <laughs> Thank you.